Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as the turkeys are thawing and perhaps the meal prep is already underway, it's a fitting time once again for us to focus on Thanksgiving. And no book of the Bible is more stuffed with thanksgiving and mashed with praise than the Psalms. Now, the Psalms are not simply stories or commandments, although sometimes they include stories and instructions, but they are a way we speak to God in, in prayer, or praise, confession, and, yes, thanksgiving. In fact, Psalm 34 is a psalm about being crazy thankful. And it's a psalm, like many other psalms, that was written by David. And David is the most personal character in the Old Testament. You know, we know more about David's feelings, you might say, passions and mind, than any other character in the Scripture. And that's not only because he was head and shoulders, uh, maybe shorter, but head and shoulders above the other kings as the best king of Israel. It's also because David opens his heart uh, to the Lord and to the rest of the congregation in the 73 Psalms that he wrote. David was, we're told, a man after God's own heart. And that's why God chose him as the king of Israel. And we can, we can really see that David is a man after God's own heart because David didn't just follow God's commands. He didn't just do what God said. No, I think a large part of David being a man after God's own heart is that David wanted and desired the right things. His passion was to see God's will be done. He aches and cries out to the Lord, to God, to, to fix the world, to forgive and save him. It's obvious in the, in, in the poetry and in the emotions that David is truly rejoicing in who God is and, and in what he has done for David. David doesn't just complain about evil that affects him. David is deeply bothered by any injustice, by unfaithfulness and idolatry. Of course, we know David sins, but he's not really prideful about it. Rather, he takes responsibility. He comes to grips with the real betrayal and the damage that his sin has done, and he does the only thing that a person can do when they've sinned. He cries out to the Lord for forgiveness. I can't recommend the Psalms highly enough for your personal devotional life. And we probably use them more often than you even realize in, in songs, hymns, liturgy. David is certainly a, a, a passionate poet and, and a skilled composer, yet it's more than just, the Psalms are more than just the recorded work, say, of someone like Emily Dickinson or Robert Frost or Langston Hughes. David was anointed by God, by the Holy Spirit, uh, to write these psalms. The Holy Spirit inspired the psalms. They're written, many of them, these 73 anyway, by God's king for God's people to sing. Now these songs were set aside and designed, as I said, to, to worship Yahweh. Um, the psalms were were sung. We don't really know how or what notes they were, but they were sung. And like any good worship song, uh, the Psalms really helped God's word sink in. It helps us digest them and make them our own, uh, that, that, that God's word becomes part of our soul. We take in God's word through songs and psalms. It helps us express things and connect with God in, in such a personal way. Um, in and in some of the Psalms, we get a little backstory, little short snippets that uh, in some cases are quite intriguing. Like, for instance, Psalm 34 is one of those places. The little subscription under Psalm 34 says, Of David, when he faked insanity before Abimelech, who drove him away and he left. It's a crazy part of the story of David. David, if you recall, was anointed the king of Israel, uh, but even though he was anointed, he, he was anointed in secret. Um, and uh, uh, he was the true king, but uh, King Saul was still actively ruling. And David always respected that fact. Even though the Lord said, and Samuel told Saul himself, even though the Lord clearly was with David, 
And I guess what Samuel told Saul is that the Lord was not with Saul anymore. David refused still to forcibly take the throne from Saul, which he could have. In fact, twice Saul was unaware and within striking distance of David's sword, but David refused to kill the Lord's anointed. Unfortunately, Saul had no such restraint. David had done Saul no wrong. In fact, David had helped him, he'd fought for him, he'd comforted him, and he'd supported him. But Saul was jealous, and he kept trying to kill David, chasing him high and low. As he was fleeing Saul, he, uh, he escaped to the Philistine city of Gath, which is kind of where we read in 1 Samuel chapter 21. First, now, this could be a little confusing. 1 Samuel 21 names the king Achish, but Psalm 34 refers to him as Abimelech. Uh, that's actually pretty common in the ancient Near East that people have multiple names that aren't exactly the same. Uh, so uh, this Abimelech is an Akish, are apparently the same character. Not that, nothing to see here, you might say. Pretty common. But the problem was, whatever we want to call this Philistine king, he was hearing the praises of David. We hear that the servants were telling, don't you know who this guy is? He's a bad man. He's a dangerous man. They said, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has defeated his tens of thousands. And so David hears this, and he's worried how the king is going to react. After all, this might seem like too tantalizing of an opportunity to follow up on. David was a powerful threat to the Philistines, and he, he defeated them repeatedly. King Achish was probably considering killing David, or at least that's the thought the servants were trying to plant, plot, plant in his mind. And uh, because David was within his grasp and had only a few men, he was very vulnerable. No, he'd never be more vulnerable, probably. So David came up with this insane plan. Literally, he pretended he was insane. He's foaming at the mouth. He's muttering gibberish and, and scratching marks on the gates with his fingernails. Uh, the king of Achish, uh, the king of Gath, Achish, Abimelech, whichever he refers to. Get this crazy guy. I got, I got enough crazy people to deal with. You don't need to bring another one into my court. And he no longer thinks of David as a threat at all, just a maniac. And so David escapes unscathed. So David has been through rather a tough stretch when he writes this psalm. He's been chased by Saul, living on the run, and now he's had to act like a crazy person just to survive. And yet, you would never really guess it by the contents of the psalm. David recognizes it's actually the Lord who has delivered him. His crazy plan would never have worked had the Lord not been involved. You might even say that David was, well, crazy thankful. He says, for instance, in verses 6 and 7, This poor man called, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Um, when we're in tough spots, it, it's easy to bellyache and complain, but David reminds us it's only really because of the Lord's provision that we survive those tough spots. Even though David's life as God's anointed king has hardly been an easy task so far, nonetheless, he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. In fact, David invites the youth and the children of the congregation, come, my children, and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and in his ears are attentive to their cry. The Lord does provide for us, and he hears your and my cries for mercy as well. That doesn't mean there will never be any trouble, but the Lord will deliver us from trouble, and the Lord will give us life. It's certainly not fruitless or futile to seek good and avoid evil. The Lord can be counted on. He will come through for those who trust in him. Jesus trusted in these promises of the Lord as well, and we can trust in it too. This uh, Thanksgiving, Psalm 34 reminds us, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
We certainly give thanks for the gifts of good food and family, whether it's turkey pie, turkey pie, turkey pie, or sweet potatoes, or whatever, or mac and cheese, or wherever it is, there's lots of good food for us to taste and see and remember the Lord who created uh, all good things and gives them to us. Yet there's an even greater reason to give thanks as well. We have a Lord and Savior who comes through for us too, even when life gets crazy. Indeed, we can taste and see that the Lord is good, not just in the food he gives us. We experience God's redemption through Christ who delivers us from any and everything, who gives us forgiveness no matter what we have done. As Psalm 34 verse 19 says, a righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord, who has not only shared his righteousness with us, but has saved us too from many troubles. And for that, we as well can be crazy thankful. In Jesus' name, amen.